Hi everybody. This video is going to be a little bit different because I'm here today in London in the beautiful building of the Royal Institution together with Dr. Rohin Francis, who's a cardiologist. And he's also a YouTuber, so he has his own channel, which is called MetLife Crisis. The plan is today that he'll be asking me questions about physics, and then I get to ask him questions. So there'll be a second part of this video, which you can watch on his channel. Rohan, this is the first time I'm talking to a cardiologist who is not busy putting things on my chest. Um, so first of all, it's great to see you. Well, it's a privilege to, to, to be here with you, Sabina. So I would just say, go ahead and shoot your questions at me. Okay, so you've obviously um, won a lot of fans with your kind of no-nonsense uh, explanations of, of physics and, and um, different things. So I'm going to be pretty blunt here and I'm going to start by asking about dark matter. Uh, you've heard of dark matter, I, I take it, yes? Yeah, good. Is this just a fudge that physicists have made up when their sums didn't work? And are we just gonna see it overturned in years to come, like we've seen lots of theories in the past uh, be disproven? I've heard physicists say this. Uh, it's something that they would say in their talk, like uh, we've just you know, given a name to it, we have no idea what it is, we don't know what most of the matter in the universe is actually made of. And I think what's happening is, they're trying to be funny, <laughs> but people don't understand that they're just joking. So I, I'm afraid dark matter is a technical term, so it's not just stuff. Um, physicists use this word to mean something very specific. To begin with, matter actually means something. So uh, matter has a very particular behavior. When the universe expands, um, usually they're talking about some pressureless fluid um, that has particular behavior under collapse. And, and this, this is all really important. It's something very different, for example, from radiation or um, vacuum energy or scalar fields or all other kinds of fields. So matter is really um, a technical term. And then also the word dark actually means something, means it doesn't interact with light. And, and also um, we know that it doesn't clump to itself or to normal matter. Um, so you see physicists don't just invent something to make their sums work out. Um, they actually have a very specific model for it, which goes into the math uh, and so on and so forth. What's funny though, is that I think uh, most people don't really know that it's a fairly technical thing. There was a very interesting interview in The Guardian a couple of months ago with an epidemiologist who was asked, how is it that the COVID death rate in Germany is so much lower than in the UK? And his idea was, oh, that's because the Germans have some type of immunological dark matter. <laughs> So he clearly used the word just to mean we have no idea what it is. But physicists actually mean something very concrete with it. So some of the maps that I've seen of dark matter sort of in the universe, um, I understand that it's, it doesn't interact with, with light. But is it, is it here? Is it in the room with us here? Or is it, is it something that's remote? So if it exists, it should be here. Yeah. Um, so it will be going through us uh, without interacting, uh, without leaving a trace. I mean, that's the problem, right? They're, they're building these big detectors and the stuff just goes through, I, if it exists, right? Which we don't know because it just goes through. What you see in these maps is that um, they have some observations, for example, gravitational lensing. So you see this distortion of the background of the galaxy and galaxy clusters. And you can use this to calculate what the density distribution of the dark matter must have been. And so this is how these maps come about. But is there actually some matter there? Um, we, we don't know. So this is just something which we infer from the data. But if you believe that this explanation for the data is correct, then yes, it should be here. And um, people can estimate the density and the velocity um, by which it should go through. Uh, what they can't estimate is how frequently it should interact, which is why you see this long series of experiments with bigger and bigger detectors and they still haven't seen anything. Yeah, so that kind of brings me to my next question about detectors, because it seems to me that every time physicists build something and they don't get the answer they want, they go, ah, we just haven't built it big enough. 
And the solution is always just to big something, build something bigger. And I understand there's now a plan to make a, a super large hadron collider that's 10 times bigger, or and then eventually build one around the, the equator of the Earth and out into, into the solar system. Um, so wh why is the solution always just to, to just go bigger? Because that's the easiest thing to do. Um, just if you lack imagination, you make it bigger, um, you get to test something that hasn't been tested before. But the underlying problem um, is actually quite deep. Um, because if you look at the history of physics or science in general, it didn't used to be the case. For a long time, if you look at the history of, say, uh, microscopes, telescopes, and so on, what happened was that they built one thing and then they learned something from it. So they developed a better understanding of nature and that helped them to develop new technologies which improved the experiments which led to better uh, insights about nature and so on and so forth. So it was this virtuous cycle. And at some point it just broke. So we, we don't really have any new technologies. Mm -hmm. We're just you know squeezing out the last drop from quantum mechanics, basically. So you're saying that we're overdue some sort of break in this cycle. Like for, if I use your telescope analogy, I guess you build bigger and bigger telescopes, but now actually there are a lot of telescopes being built which are using different technologies. But you're saying particle colliders, we're waiting for a sort of change in the technologies. Is that right or? Well, uh, I would say we should be waiting for a change in technology because obviously if you just make things bigger, they get more expensive. Like right. f f for example, for this collider, you would have to dig this tunnel, uh, which is like a hundred kilometers long and that costs several, costs several billions. Yeah. Um, so a size in and by itself eats up a lot of money. Mm -hmm. uh, and the problem is that there um, have not been any great technological changes that could have shrunken things back into, <laughs> uh, into a manageable um, size. Um, but there's also like a, a deeper question behind this, uh, which is what um, John Horgan has been going on about in his book, The End of Science. Like, is there yeah. actually something else to find or is this it? Like, mm -hmm. do we just have to live with it? And that's the best we can do. But surely that's not the case, is it? Or, I mean, I hear these claims that you know, matter that we understand is a tiny minority, five, ten percent of the universe or something. Um, and this remainder, the dark matter or uh, plus minus dark energy, um, you know, there is still a lot yet to be understood. So, do, I mean, do you agree with uh, Horgan's statement that um, this is it or...? No, of course I don't agree, and you know, I think most physicists don't uh, agree with him. Uh, but I think it's not it's not quite as uh, simple. I mean, there there are some open questions. Uh, for example, dark matter is like uh, we already talked about this, um, but also there's uh, the quantization of gravity. There's the measurement problem in quantum mechanics. Um, but for a long time, people, especially string theorists, have propagated this idea that we are really close to finding. A theory of everything, which would be the last thing to ever be said about the foundations of physics. And um, it's a reasonable question to ask, like if this theory exists and if we find it, will it actually be good for something? Mm -hmm. And uh, I think most people who work in this field don't expect it to be actually good for something because it, it you know, it, it uses energy in such high ranges um, that it's unclear what we would ever be able to use it for. Right. Yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll refrain from saying anything cheeky about um, physics research. I mean, there's a lot that doesn't seem that useful. As, as you can probably tell, viewers, I'm, I'm here today to represent the uneducated non-physicist asking dumb questions. So you, you mentioned sort of the problems with, with quantizing gravity, and I understand part of the issue of trying to achieve this um, theory of everything is marrying up quantum theory with, with gravity. So what, what actually, to, to someone like me, a, a layman, what actually is the, the problem with trying to do that? Well, we don't know how to do it. Okay, That's simple right. as that. <laughs> so, so we do have um, ways, mathematical methods, um, to make a quantum theory out of a non-quantum theory. And people have applied those methods um, to gravity, uh, Einstein's theory of general relativity, 
and um, it turns out that it doesn't properly work. So you get a theory this way, which is called perturbatively quantized gravity. Mm -hmm. And that's fine as an approximation. So it's believed to be okay at low energies, um, but it breaks down at fairly high energies in, in the sense that the mathematics just stops making sense. So you get probabilities larger than one or all kinds of nonsense. Mm -hmm. So that can't be the answer. So this normal method of quantization doesn't work. And then that's the question, what do you do? Because um, we have an actual inconsistency between those theories. So if we just take general relativity and quantum theory, they don't work together. So there has to be a solution because nature knows how to do it somehow, but we don't know how nature does it. In the attempt of solving this problem, physicists have made up all kinds of theories, like string theories, one of them, uh, loop quantum gravity, causal dynamical triangulation, and so on. They're all mathematically fine, I would say, more or less. But the problem is that we have absolutely no experimental evidence for any one of them. Is that something we're, we're going to get soon? I believe so, yes. Um, so, But I have to say that most physicists would probably not believe this. So to me, it's a huge irony. So I've been working on how to experimentally test quantum gravity for a decade or something. And people will always be like, no, no, no way. And um, what's happened since, like in the past five to 10 years or something, is that experimentalists have gotten on the case. And experimentalists are like, they don't talk, they just do. And so I think at some point, they're just, come with the measurement and say, okay, so we've measured it, now please explain it. <laughs> and then the theorists will be, you know, oh my God, you know, we never thought you'd be able to do it. And I mean, it's not going to happen tomorrow, but maybe in 10 or 20 years. And there will certainly be a Nobel Prize for it. Yeah. So I, I find it just ridiculous that theorists aren't even, they're not even making predictions mm. for the experiments. Changing tack slightly, um, how do we know there's nothing smaller uh, than a quark? Yeah, very good question. Um, so for, for starters, particle physicists don't really like to talk about the size of particles because this is all quantum and things and, yeah. and they're really just fuzzy clouds and, and so on. But one can, can ask the question without talking about size, like could it be that quarks are made of something else, like that they're, they're not themselves fundamental? There are two problems with it. <laughs> the one is that it's theoretically hard to make work. Um, surprisingly. And the other thing is that it's just not compatible with uh, experiment, at least not so far. Because you haven't built a big enough collider. The way that colliders work is that you slam particles into each other with a very high center of mass energy. Mm -hmm. And because of quantum things, everything that can happen will happen with a certain probability. If the energy allows it, so if you have particles with a fairly small mass, you'll produce them. And this means that you will detect the lightest particles the easiest. Mm -hmm. uh, now, what happens if you take a particle like a quark, of which you know the mass, uh, and you imagine it's made of other things, then the masses of the constituent particles have to be smaller. Mm -hmm. But then we'd already have seen them. I understood, yeah, okay. So, so that doesn't work. And then what you can do is um, you can try to make it work the same way it actually works for the proton, um, because um, the, the proton is made of quarks, um, but the quarks were actually discovered far later than the proton. So that seems to contradict what I said earlier. But the reason is that it takes a lot of energy to pull these quarks apart uh, right. because the strong nuclear force is strong, mm -hmm. uh, as the name says. And so you can do the same with the quarks. Um, you can make them up of smaller things that are strongly bound to each other. And there are theories for this. So, so it's called technicolor, and the smaller things are called prions. And they've looked for them at the LHC and didn't see it. So um, at least the most straightforward theories have just been ruled out. But, you know, you can always make more difficult theories and, yeah. and then you can say, well, we need a bigger collider. Well, one thing I, I did get from uh, your answer there is uh, to just say, if we don't know, because of quantum things, I'm going to take that phrase. And um, next time a patient asks me something I don't know the answer to, I'll say, it's, just, it's because of quantum things. Um, what's your favorite particle? Clearly the neutrino. 
Yeah. So for one, because neutrinos are a little bit odd and a little bit weakly interacting, so I identify with this personally. <laughs> uh, but there's also, um, I think they're our most promising evidence for new physics um, in particle physics. You know, there's dark matter that you have an astrophysics cosmology, but in particle physics, it's the neutrinos. Mm -hmm. I actually have a video coming up about this because there's an anomaly in neutrino physics, which um, was recently confirmed, like in, in 2018, but for reasons that are entirely mysterious to me, pretty much no one paid any attention to it. There's a pattern in the oscillation of the neutrinos that just can't be explained with the standard model. So we know that there has to be something else. And one of the maybe most exciting possibilities is that it's actually also a signature for dark matter. Wow, okay. That's, I didn't know that about it. Uh, neutrinos don't get a lot of um, attention, I think. Uh, seeing as I know nothing about any of these, uh, my favorite particle uh, is from when I was at high school and uh, I learned the names of all the quarks and I saw that one was called bottom and I just felt very sorry. And <laughs> ever since then, I've had a soft spot for, for, for bottom quark because I just think, what a name to be lumbered with. It's also sometimes called the beauty quark. Oh, well, that's, that's, uh, that's a much nicer name. I'm going to call bottom the beauty quark from now on. Zamina, can you magnet somebody to death? You're asking for a particular purpose? Uh, no comment. <laughs> yeah, it's a good question. It's not, it's not easy to answer. Um, so to begin with, the, there are three different types of magnetism. There's the ferromagnetism, the paramagnetism, and the diamagnetism. So the one that we normally all know about is just the ferromagnetism. Mm -hmm. That's the thing. Uh, you know, with the magnets that you pin to the fridge and, and that kind of stuff. Uh, the other two are kind of responsive. So if you if you put something into a magnetic field, um, then these materials mm -hmm. will respond to it. And if you've seen uh, the footage of the levitating frog, uh, I think that was diamagnetism. Mm -hmm. um, so these materials will be repelled by the magnetic field. So um, the, the human body is not ferromagnetic. Uh, no, no matter what, what you hear, vaccines also don't make you ferromagnetic. You can't pin keys to your face. So you claim. But there are various parts of the human body, various substances that are either paramagnetic or mm -hmm. diamagnetic. Um, so what's going to happen if you um, put any kind of organism in a really, really strong magnetic field, as, is that um, different parts of a cell or maybe different chemical molecules will react slightly differently. And at some point, I suspect, and I'm really just guessing, uh, it's going to cause a problem because some chemical reactions um, you know, won't work the way that they're supposed to work, and that's bad news. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, uh, I mean, even if, if that doesn't kill you, what's going to happen eventually, like if the magnetic field is really, really strong, is that it will... Um, distort the energy levels of electrons um, and then you just fall apart. <laughs> I mean, would you, I assume you might just heat up as well, right? Is, is, is that the case in a, in a super strong? Well, if it's a static field, um, I don't really see why there would be a lot of energy transport. Mm -hmm. But of course, that's the, you know, a static magnetic field isn't really a thing. It's like an eternal black hole. You know, you have to switch it on. You have to yeah. get people in. And yeah, you're probably right. You know, what probably would kill you is if you get into the magnetic field or if it switches on. Yeah. But I mean, in all fairness, you know, if you, you, you want to kill someone, it's much easier to do with an electric field. Um, sure. I mean, I've got access to very powerful MRI scanners, you see, but that's unrelated to why I'm asking. Um, but when I, I have been inside a seven Tesla MRI um, machine, um, and it's, it's remarkable how you, you do feel sort of something happening, like you can feel some um, nerve ending excitation, you get these sort of tingles. Uh, which is noticeably different in a 3 or a 1.5 Tesla MRI. Um, my, my PhD research is all MRI based. So this is maybe a slightly um, odd question, but in a sort of commercial oven, you can get the temperature sort of 300 degrees above room temperature without too much problem. So it's not that, not, not a lot of work needed, but only 300 degrees lower than room temperature um, is as low as you can go. And everything that we kind of know here on Earth is, is, relatively speaking, not that far from absolute zero. And then obviously go a huge direction 
further up from there. So my question is, how come all of life that we know here and, and, and sort of all these processes that occur on Earth are actually not that far off from absolute zero? How come absolute zero isn't, isn't way, way lower? Yeah, I guess. I mean, if you look at most of the matter in the galaxy, it, it'll be in stars and it'll be tens of millions sure. of degrees or something. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I, I think you're right. So it, it's a little bit curious, like, why is it that everything we know and like is at comparably low temperature? I mean, ultimately, it comes down to the constants of nature. But it's because at high temperature, it's very, very difficult to form structures. Mm -hmm. They just fall apart immediately. And it's only if you get to fairly low temperatures that um, atoms will stick together and you get interesting chemistry and stuff starts to happen. <laughs> you know, you get cells, organisms, um, society, culture, all yeah. that kind of stuff. It, it, it needs to be at fairly low temperature. Slightly uh, more f abstract, or should we say philosophical one, uh, how do you personally think the universe is going to, to go? Honestly, I don't think much about it. Um, Fair enough. <laughs> I, I recently, I, I read a book from uh, Lawrence Krauss, uh, who's, yeah. you know, an, an, an astrophysicist, cosmologist. Uh, and, and he had this very funny quote, where well, I thought it was funny, where he says, he only makes predictions trillions of years into the future because no one will be around to check if he's right. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I think that's very spot on. Um, how much should you trust these predictions? Um, I, I think it's all just speculations. There, there is a very fundamental problem to making predictions over so long timescales, because if there's any kind of effect which is really, really tiny on the timescales that we have observations for so far, it may still kick in big time um, in the infinite future, because infinity is a really long time. There's just no way you can rule this out. So what's happening is basically that the error on your prediction uh, gets infinitely large. Um, and, and so I think all these speculations are pretty much nonsense. I mean, you, you can look at them as a mathematical exercise. We just take the equations that we have so far and we run them into the future and that'll give us an answer. But don't take it seriously. Error rate approaching infinity is, is, reminds me of my A-level maths. Um, <laughs> finally, uh, I, I've, I've, uh, I, don't, I don't want to give the impression that I'm, I'm preoccupied with, with killing people here, but how would you actually die when you go into a, a black hole? Realistically, if you look at an actual black hole, like the ones that we actually see in the centers of galaxies and so on, they're usually surrounded by really hot gas. Mm -hmm. So, you know, for practical purposes, that would probably kill you before yeah. you even fall into the black hole. True, yeah. Yeah, but uh, I mean, we can think of a mathematical black hole that just sits there in empty space and, and you fall in. Um, so, so the one thing that's curious and which people sometimes get confused about is that when you cross the event horizon, nothing actually happens. It's not like it is some kind of barrier, mm. but locally around you, there's just nothing. It's, it's empty space. And um, exactly how strong the curvature is, like the space-time curvature at the horizon depends on the size of the black hole. It could actually be very small. Mm. But what happens is that once you're inside the horizon, uh, you can't get back out or you, you would have to travel faster than the speed of light uh, to get out. What's happening then is that you get two different forces. I say you're, you're falling in head first. Then the gravitational pull on your head will be somewhat stronger than on your feet. Mm -hmm. So you'll get stretched. And um, that'll get stronger and stronger the closer you get to the singularity. So now if you're asking at exactly which point do you die, so I'm not sure, you know, eventually you'll just be ripped into pieces. Yeah. But I would suspect that uh, long before this, it, it becomes very difficult to pump around um, blood. And um, exactly when this would kill you, you, you'd have to ask a cardiologist. Ah, uh, well, it's, it's good to be prepared for all eventualities. You never know when this might happen, but uh, I guess like Lawrence Krauss's predictions, we'll probably never find out. Um, well, Zabina, thank you so much for letting me ask these daft questions. Um, I hope they haven't been too stupid, uh, but it's been a lot, a lot of fun listening to your answers. So thanks very much. 
Well, I hope you had fun too, um, listening to Rohin's question and my <laughs> attempts to answer them. Um, as I said, there will be a second part to this video where I get to ask him questions, so you don't want to miss this out. So head over to his channel and hear what he has to say. This video was sponsored by NordVPN. Do you also sometimes think you should be more careful when you browse the internet, especially when you're traveling? NordVPN makes this super easy. NordVPN is an app that you install on your phone or laptop and you use it to connect to one of their more than 5,000 servers all over the world. Then you can browse the web from there. This keeps your data safe, even on a public wireless. Using this app has the added benefit that if you ever encounter a video or website that is blocked where you are, you can just connect to a server in a different country and access the website from there. Viewers of this channel can now enjoy a special offer with a huge discount if you go to nordvpn.com sabina and use the coupon code sabina. NordVPN is super easy to use. It runs on pretty much all devices and platforms, Windows, iOS, what have you. Once again, that's nordvpn.com slash Sabine and the coupon code Sabine. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to check out the second part of this video. See you next week.